uh, I think it started. So uh, I don't record too many of these. I'm going to try to keep it as quick as possible. So I'm going to read off this tablet. Um, I'm making it a video thing because it humanizes it a bit. Hopefully makes it a little easier to digest. And because I have friends and family that I'm sure would enjoy uh, seeing me once every now and then. And it's been a while since my last one. So um, earlier today, I asked Joss Whedon for his thoughts about protest voting uh, during his live broadcast for Save the Day that vote uh, a great campaign that you may have seen, uh, a series of celebrities. Uh, there's a video link that I'll post related to it, but if you haven't seen it, it's definitely worth it. Um, and yeah, so I was really surprised when uh, towards the end of his 30 minute uh, talk, he entertained my question. Um, and I was uh, a little surprised, but not entirely surprised to find that his, uh, Joss's opinion strongly opposed my own. And so um, after a bit of processing, uh, I, a phoenix of epiphany rose from the fiery ashes of my ego, and I, uh, in the process of keeping an open mind, uh, realized that I may have kind of lost my argument, but in the process won a shiny new perspective. Um, so, victory. Um, and I, I like that victory. Uh, it feels like this new perspective has a bit more flesh to it, uh, a bit better like mouthfeel, kind of like a ger arg mouthfeel. Anyways, uh, zombie humor. Um, so yes, I still think the electoral process in the U.S. is uh, deeply, extremely, egregiously flawed, um, kind of absurd, and a lot of the drama and the, uh, the things that come up as points of debate uh, for a lot of people I think are symptoms of those flaws in the in the system. But um, the thing that Joss helped convince me during his talk was that the time to work on those flaws is November 9th or later, and not November 8th. And that's um, it's a it's a challenging thing for me to kind of accept, but at the same time, it, the mouthfeel, the, the the fleshy reality of it, it seems a bit truthier. So um, I still think it's really important to try to improve the U.S. electoral system, uh, but uh, you know, fixing its flaws it would give uh, us better candidates and more voting power. Um, I don't think a robust election system should force uh, force people to select between the lesser of two evils. I think there's a lot of ways of making that work better. Uh, I'm going to list those at the end just so I don't not boring people with those details. Um, I previously favored protest voting for three main reasons. Um, I saw it kind of as a boycott um, using the currency of elections, which are votes instead of dollars, to motivate electoral reform. So instead of voting with one's dollars, you're voting with your vote, saying I, I'm going to allocate my vote in a different way um, than you would like me to allocate it because I don't believe in the system. And if you change the system, then maybe I'll allocate that vote in a way that you would prefer. Um, so I saw that. Uh, I also saw kind of protest voting as a, a form of rebellion. So there's an emotional reward with that. Like just the act of rebelling uh, gives an emotional satisfaction of self-empowerment. So there's a bit of that going on there. And um, prioritizing election reform was really important to me, like prioritizing the reform of the electoral process over results of the electoral process. So we go through this every four years and we have the same problems every time and everyone's always complaining about spoiler candidates and uh, how they just wish they could vote for the one they really wanted and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I, f I feel like protest voting is a way to prioritize reforming the electoral process over simply getting the best possible result from the current electoral results or the, the current cycle. But again, um, I think Joss's point is the time to work on that is November 9th and later and not on actual voting day. Um, to try to work on that through pro protest voting is um, ineffective in reality, probably, and uh, perhaps more so uh, just maybe a little delusional. So um, let's see, I just want to try to cover real quick because I'm already rambling. Um, so I didn't really change my opinion, uh, especially not because it was Joss Whedon, 
I mean, you know, he is Joss Whedon, yes, uh, but uh, it actually, just due to the ambiguity of the phrase protest voting, he kind of interpreted, and his take on protest voting is different than my own. So um, some of the arguments that I might make in favor of protest voting are kind of invalidated or irrelevant because he interprets protest voting in a different way than I do. But um, that in itself was relevant and important. It was a good revelation because I've had this conversation about protest voting and about electoral reform with a lot of very intelligent people, very rational, uh, capable, logical people uh, with analytical minds. And not a single person that I've ever talked to, uh, including Joss Whedon, I've talked to, but not there, but I've talked to other in other contexts, um, doesn't share my perspective on, uh, on electoral reform. And, you know, I guess when I've talked to as many people as I have about it and I, I can keep telling myself, you know, maybe I just haven't met enough uh, truly intelligent people. <laughs> um, so maybe I just need to talk to more people before I'll find. But when you talk to enough people and also Joss Whedon doesn't agree with you, then it's like, oh, well, maybe maybe I'm not such an enlightened uh, erudite after all. Maybe I'm uh, maybe I'm the asshole out of everybody. So there's a bit of sense of the reality of the situation is that even if my opinion about what vote, vote, you know protest voting is and and what its effects may be is there. Um, the reality is almost everyone else that I've talked to and respect and admire um, think differently about it, and uh, that's just how it is. And it's kind of a frustrating thing for me to deal with, but also at the same time, uh, reality is reality, and uh, I can still have belief in my own ideas, but also. Uh, except the fact that maybe my own ideas are a little naive uh, or ignorant or perhaps just woefully misguided. And I am just uh, trying to salvage what I can from those fiery ashes of ego. Um, my own processes or my own understanding of protest voting and electoral reform stems largely from my background in computer science, uh, from game theory, from metagaming, um, and probably in a healthy not unhealthy, but maybe an over for Ender's Game and analyzing agendas and motivations and that kind of thing. But um, I'm a bit of a, what they call, brilliant skeptic or aka paranoid person. So it's uh, probably a habit of mine to overanalyze these things and perhaps blow certain things out of proportion and prioritize things differently than perhaps they uh, could be prioritized in a more effective fashion. So that, regardless, my own experience is not a very common tapestry of experience. So it's, it's probably fairly unrealistic for me to expect many, if any, uh, other people to share this perspective that I have about uh, the meaning of protest voting and electoral reform and how protest voting could motivate electoral reform. So yeah, anyways, uh, thank you very much to Joss and uh, to everyone else who I've talked with and had discourse with online about the idea of uh, electoral reform and protest voting and whether or not to vote for a particular candidate, even if you don't really like them, um, as much as you might have liked a third party candidate, uh, that kind of thing. I, I kind of agree now that, um, yeah, focusing on that after the election is probably the most effective thing. And the the, the phrase protest voting, I can see kind of being a dangerous one, kind of like Joss said, um, kind of Im implies a sense of effective empowerment. The idea of being able to protest vote or lodge a protest vote gives one that sense of emotional reward as if they're doing something effective, but without actually probably doing anything effective. Because the reality, as Joss said, is nobody's going to be, you know, tallying up the protest votes and trying to woo the protest voters. Um, the reality is that those votes, given the flaws in the current system, are really probably just going to go to waste in the sense that, uh, yes, the system sucks. Um, yes, the protest votes, votes are there to maybe say the system sucks, but nothing's going to come of those. And so um, there are different things that people can do to perhaps try to affect changes in that in the future. Um, I think the only thing I wanted to kind of finish up with was just listing off the, the quick fixable flaws in the voting system. So yeah, this is kind of boring, I'll just go through it real quick. Um, two parties, spoiler candidates, um, wasted votes, all these concepts uh, stem from 
first past the vote or first past the post voting, also known as plurality voting, just one vote per person, like all of those concepts, the two party system, just the fact that we only have two parties to choose from most of the time with two viable candidates, uh, spoiler candidates and wasted votes, those all I'm, I'm, the evidence is pretty strong, I think, to show that it's our system of voting that creates those, and that can be changed, that can be fixed. And if we do that, then we'll potentially get better candidates, and we'll have a voting system that lets us vote for perhaps a Ron Paul or a Bernie Sanders or whoever, and still have that vote go towards Hillary Clinton or someone like that, um, if, that if our first choice doesn't work out. If they don't win, then our vote isn't wasted. It can still go towards an effective purpose. And there's just, it's a, it's a minor change. And it's still not, it's not a perfect change. There's still ways of gaming that, but it's a significant change. Um, the Electoral College, uh, representative voting and uh, gerrymandering, those are all flaws that can be fixed. Um, super PACs and campaign finance reform issues, um, money in politics, basically, uh, the stuff that Ben and Jerry kind of uh, work hard to, to fight against. These things can be fixed. Um, the effect of mass media and uh, private interests on elections through super PACs and other stuff. Um, gaming of party elections, you know, through mechanisms like uh, closed primaries or uh, super delegates in this most recent election or that kind of thing, you know, using super delegates to influence voter perception. Um, those can be fixed. Um, these uh, let's see, there's, there's e-voting and vote rigging. Um, like there, you know, there are cases of documented, um, you know, e-voting machines being intentionally rigged in a very, very intelligent fashion. So they're not swinging votes by like 60% or 40%. They're swinging them by like one or 2%, but only in very close races. So they'd be very hard to detect, but still have a very tangible Im impact on elections. And so a lot of these ways that systems are gamed, like even the fact that voting happens on a Tuesday, that's not a holiday. So you're already automatically um, disenfranchising anyone who can't afford to miss a day of work on a Tuesday. Um, they, they just simply, they either have to be proactive and go through a, a more rigorous process of uh, mailing in their vote in advance or that kind of thing. Uh, and then they don't get that sense of participating in the crowd, like it's the difference between participating in a in a movie in a theater and enjoying a theater as a group experience and having that empowerment and that that social experience that goes along with it, and enjoying a movie at home. Um, it's just not as fun. Like people don't want to just mail in their vote and feel like they're kind of participating, but not really. There's a sense of social camaraderie that goes along with voting with everyone else on the same day. And if that day is a Tuesday and it's not a holiday it's a work day, a lot of people simply can't take that day off and they're not motivated enough to mail in their vote in advance or vote in advance and so they just don't vote. Um, that There's all these different subtle ways that the system is um, either intentionally or accidentally gamed and most of these ways are understood and well documented as actually they do happen and and people and systems do take advantage of these things, and they do so in a very intelligent way. Um, they're not doing it in an obvious way. They're not gerrymandering the hell out of everything and making it very obvious, except in certain cases, such as in my great state of North Carolina, where the Supreme Court, I think, or a federal court or something recently just said, yeah, you guys are kind of obviously doing this really bad thing, and you should really stop. Um, but everybody knows when you see those lines of... Uh, voting area demarcations and they're just all bizarre shapes like there's reasons for that it's not just like some you know random chance that oh these are following uh, water basin lines or something like that or county lines they're they're segregating voter demographics for strategic purposes and it's very hard to prove that they're doing that because they're not doing it so much that it makes it provably obvious they're doing it just enough to influence and change election results without getting caught red-handed at it. And that happens all across the board everywhere. And so, yeah, we're, we're all stuck in this system of, you know, it's a very flawed system and it's being taken advantage of by people in power who rely on that to stay in power. Um, so the people in power who have the power to change the system don't have motivation to change the system. So anyways, uh, enough of that. I just wanted to kind of do this thing in one take, and I think I managed it, and it went over like 
15 minutes longer than I wanted it to, but if you're still watching this, then I'm sorry. <laughs> so anyways, have a good one.